My name is John DeVille. I am the uh, Vice President of Macon County NCAE. I'm a teacher here at Franklin High School. On behalf of the local chapter of NCAE, Progress North Carolina, and Public Schools First for North Carolina, I'd like to welcome you here this evening for our town hall meeting. Uh, we have several excellent speakers for you tonight. Well, hopefully when you leave tonight, you're better informed about what's going on. Hopefully when you leave tonight, you have some specific strategies that you can employ to lift us up from the bottom, which is where North Carolina is right now in terms of its commitment to K-12 public education. That's not where we've been historically. That's why you probably came out tonight. That's why these forums are being held across the state. Uh, we're starting, uh, the, the, uh, these uh, folks who are speaking tonight are part of organizations that have already gone around to major metropolitan areas, and now they're making a second pass through the state, through the rural areas. So they're going from Macon County all the way to New uh, Our first speaker this evening is Patsy Kieber. Patsy is a native North Carolinian. She's born and raised in Charlotte. Uh, she put on here what year she graduated from Duke in Western Carolina, but I'm not going to tell you. Uh, she moved to Asheville with her late husband in the 70s, and after his service in Vietnam, she raised, uh, she raised two daughters. She now has five grandchildren. She taught in North Carolina public schools for 25 years, mostly in the 8th grade in Bonham County. Patsy served three terms on the Buckingham County Board of Commissioners from 1992 to 2004. She served one term in North Carolina General Assembly in the House of Representatives, and she is a lifelong supporter of public education in North Carolina. She is currently on the board of Public Schools First in North Carolina, and I'm going to turn the program. got all these toys here. I've got my clicker, so I'm, I'm all, almost ready. I want to welcome all of you here tonight. We're so glad to see you, and I am thrilled that there are this many people in Franklin and thereabouts who are interested in what's happening in the public schools, because folks, we, we have some problems, and uh, that's why we've had this meeting here tonight. We're going to share with you some of those problems from, uh, I'm going to give you a legislative overview, and then we've got some fabulous speakers here, people that you know from your own community who are going to share some of their stories with you. There will be a question and answer after they talk, so uh, I am representing Public Schools First, which is a statewide organization. That's uh, the big screen, and thank you so much, John DeVille, for doing, getting everybody together and setting everything up. We are thrilled. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Garrett Brenner, who is with Progress North Carolina, who is also helping us tonight and who is standing there to help me stay on time. Uh, we're going to try to run a tight ship, but I've got a microphone so we could be in trouble. Uh, Rodney Ellis, who is the state president of the NCAE, is with us tonight and he will give, he'll finish up for us. So I'll go ahead and get started. And um, I have to tell you, I, was a t I haven't taught in 10 years. I have never done a PowerPoint, but I am very excited to have this little laser. <laughs> the, uh, what do, okay, what do I point it at though? That's what I don't know. Okay. Well, okay, I hit that one, nothing happened. Oh, I'm hitting the wrong button. This is a learning experience, so bear with me. Uh, and also, this is the first time that we, that Public Schools First has, North Carolina has done this particular um, PowerPoint. So if you see something that you think needs to be changed or if you have questions at the end or something you would like us to add, please feel free to share that with me after the meeting. So let's get started and let me get organized. Have I forgotten to introduce anybody yet? Okay. Did it come off? It went off. I'm, I'm sorry. I am learning and I'm like to do this again in some other places, so I'm just trying to get my system down, so uh, I appreciate your help. As many of you know, there is, this thing keeps going off. Is that me or is it it? As many of you know, there have been serious belt tightening in the K-12 public education system. 
but nothing like we are seeing this year. Before we get into a few details about the budget just enacted by the General Assembly, I want to remind everyone where we started in terms of resources last year. All right, and so, John? Don't you hate it when you're at one of these and the person running it has no idea what they're doing? I apologize. Um, except that, okay. This is the national rankings. We have gone from 24th in the nation in 10 short years with teacher salaries to 46th. And uh, in the Asheville paper not too long ago, there was an editorial cartoon, you know, our first in flight, it had 46th in education. Uh, I cut that out, it was an eye opener to me. 20% of our teachers make the lowest amount on the state scale, which is $30,800. Teachers with five years experience make thirty-one thousand two hundred, and it takes twenty. It takes fifteen years for new teachers to earn forty thousand dollars. You know that doesn't sound too bad to me because I quit 20, ten years ago. I retired ten years ago, but that's not much in today's world. And even more startling. All right, I'm going to need somebody else to work this thing. You know, y'all are guinea pigs. Think how much better I'm going to be the next time I do this. Even more startling, our per pupil funding is now lower than all states that border North Carolina, which I personally found a little embarrassing. You know, that's not the right one. You know, what I need is a teacher who is now teaching. Rodney, you want to take that over? Okay, that'd be great. Okay, we're ready for the next one. We want to, it should be the budget impact on students. It's the other way. See, I'm glad this is not working too well for Rodney either. <laughs> no, I want the next one. Next one, okay. All right, the budget impact on students. When legislators, legislators voted to support the budget that we now have, this is what happened. First thing is we lost 2,500 seats for pre-K students. Cuts to textbooks, technology, and instructional supplies. I know my grandchildren in uh, Wilmington have, are having, they can't take their books home because they don't have enough books for everybody to take their books home and do their homework. The budget for English as a second language was cut by half, and on a note, the state graduation, statewide graduation rate has improved in every category except the ESL students, and you can see that budget was cut in half, so duh. Next one. All right, now this graph illustrates funding patterns for K-12 from 2008-2009 school year to the 2013-2014 year. Per pupil funding is down in, in absolute dollars by $327 per pupil, while enrollment has increased by more than 30,000 students. And we will hear from our governor that they're spending more money on education uh, than they ever have. But if you look at it with inflation in mind and the number of students that have gone up, that doesn't make sense. The teacher working conditions are student learning conditions. These are the things that teachers are facing. No raises, larger class sizes, removal of the due process rights. That is called tenure. A lot of people are concerned about tenure, but that's absolutely nothing but due process. Removal of salary increases for graduate degrees. Those of us who have earned their masters or were working on masters will no longer be paid for those. 3,800 teacher assistant positions were cut. 5,200 teacher positions were cut. Cuts to professional development and mentoring support was cut. In addition to direct loss of program funding for teachers, this is what our teachers have had to put up with, excuse me, for students. 
Now, the logic of all this, more students, fewer teachers. In summary, since 2008, the student-to-teacher ratio grew from 13.6 to 15.5. Changes for teacher recruitment and training, and this one is really dire in my opinion because what we've gone from is a North Carolina Teaching Fellows Program which took the best and brightest from our high schools, gave them four years of college, worked with them for the four years, and the persistence, the rate of, of retention for that was 78%. What they've changed to, what this legislature has changed to, is the Teach for America program, where they take high, high achieving grads from country, they train them in five weeks, and this retention rate there is 10% leave within five years. In addition, another little fun fact is that the $11 million that has gone into teaching America would be the $11 million that we need to uh, pay our teachers for their master's degree. So we took away the master's degree, took away that $11 million and replaced it with a program that's not as good as the one we already had. Now, privatization with full accountability, school vouchers, everybody know about school vouchers? Okay, big bad, uh, a lot of money. In addition, the General Assembly, in a time of austerity, launched a school voucher program. The $11 million taken from public school funds for private or religious tuition is what is needed uh, to pay for the current master's degree. And I think I just said that it was used for something else. Privatization of little accountability, we have $4,200 per student per year. The vouchers only provide a maximum of $4,200 per student per year, which means if you were in the lower level of the slice not the upper crust, paying them to go to this religious or private school, whereas the public schools that we all know and love are left with the people who are more destitute, who need more help, and uh, it just seems obviously wrong to me. Private or religious schools do not have to provide transportation or meals. They do not have to have certified teachers. They do not have to meet legal safeguards for special needs children. And they use the same test to measure student progress. They do not, that's a mistake. They do not use the same test to measure student progress, right? That's, that. Do not. We need to change that. Is it right? Okay. Do not have to. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Charter schools. All right. They, they got a big win. Do I? Oh, I'm sorry. Do we need to go back? Oh, okay. We didn't see that. That's not on the list. Okay, we won't worry about it. They don't have to admit all students. That's what we were talking about up here. We're having a little teacher conversation. Um, all right, now charter schools are public schools. They are not private schools, but they can run for profit, corporate, cookie cutter charter chains. Now I know that in some places the charter schools are very good. I know Buncombe County has some very good charter schools, but across the state, that's not necessarily the way it is. So we have minimal oversight by limited officer, office of charter school staff. Do not have to provide transportation or meals. I know you can all read. Only 50% of teachers need to be certified. Have no curriculum requirements. Can expand one grade level per year without approval. And no longer subject, subject to local school board impact statements. No limits on number of charters, 170 new letters of intent submitted just this year. So you think about all of that and we realize we're not quite, you know, we're not playing on a level ground anymore. And public education is what we have known is the level playing ground for everybody. That's what gives us all an equal chance. Charter schools, we are not having that equal chance. So here we are. This is why you of cuts being reported in newspapers across the entire state. It's at this point that I will pause and 
we will have our speakers come up one at a time and share with us briefly their personal stories. And we'll have question and answer after that. We'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Chris Baldwin, Superintendent of Macon County Schools. Thank you, John. Thank you, Patsy. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking all of our sponsors tonight for sponsoring this forum and bringing us all together. I'd also like to thank all of you for being here tonight uh, because this message is important. It's important for our students and it's important for the future of Macon County and for North Carolina. As, Ms., as you saw with Ms. Keeper's uh, presentation, she did an outstanding job of explaining our current budget situation. But honestly, uh, most teachers understand that our nation and our state are in financial trouble and have been. And we've dealt with the losses in funding the best way that we can. But now there seems to be more of an attack on public education and teachers, especially in North Carolina. As Patsy said, funding for teacher pay, classroom materials, textbook, textbooks, and support has been slashed. One legislator re recently explained it and justified the cuts to education and teacher pay by saying they just weren't getting the outcomes that they would have liked to have seen from public education in North Carolina. And my, my two main goals tonight are, number one, to address that statement and also to discuss some of the impacts of our budget, our state budget, on student outcomes. One very important student outcome is obviously graduation. After six consecutive years of improvements, North Carolina is graduating just over 80% of our students. And in Macon County, we're graduating over 86% of our students. That is the best we've ever done in Macon County or in North Carolina. <laughs> just last week, the College Board released the national SAT results. And North Carolina students continue to improve on the SAT at a faster rate than the rest of the nation. And in Macon County, we were recognized as one of the top 25 districts in the state of North Carolina in terms of SAT scores. <laughs> Over the past school year, we've also seen improvements on our ACT scores and our AP exam scores or advanced placement scores were outstanding this past year. Students are graduating from our schools and going on to earn high salaries in, uh, in occupations such as welding and other vocational uh, opportunities. The bottom line is we're graduating more students now who are college and career ready than, than ever before. These outcomes and many others are worthy of the resources needed to support classrooms, textbooks, and respectable teacher pay. Our state responded to these outcomes in early August when Macon County received our state uh, funding allocation. This allocation was based on our ADM, our average daily membership, and it also included a $1.6 million reduction from our state planning allotment that we'd received earlier in the spring. What this means is that the state cut our state paid teacher allocation by 15 positions. They reduced our uh, teacher assistant allocation by $345,000. They cut our English as second language support by $17,000. We also lost an instructional support position and 50% of our classroom material uh, allocation, as well as 77% of our textbook allocation. What this means to our county is that we have 14 fewer teachers this year. We have 10 fewer teacher assistants. Two outstanding assistant principals were lured away to another state for significant pay raises, for pay raises. And we, Macon County, cannot even afford to replace those positions this year. Excellent teaching candidates chose to stay in their home state rather than accept positions for decreased pay in North Carolina. These losses are obviously having an impact on our classroom and on our students. Class sizes are going up, especially at Franklin High School, where we lost four teaching positions. We lost a math teacher, a science teacher, a language arts teacher, and a social studies teacher. Cartuga J Elementary and Iowa Valley Elementary Schools no longer have assistant principals to support students, parents, and teachers. 
All of our elementary schools are feeling the, uh, the impact of the loss of teacher assistance. One adult in a classroom of 20 or more students struggling to read is not going to get anyone the outcomes that we want or need. And those children in those classrooms deserve the outcomes that teacher assistance can help them to provide. Our school system has also struggled with the loss to, of classroom materials and textbooks. The additional cuts of textbooks this year was particularly hurtful because we haven't been able to purchase textbooks in many years. Our teachers and students are mastering the new North Carolina Standard Course of Study with textbooks that are aligned to the old curriculum when they have textbooks at all. In many cases, in Macon County, our, our classrooms don't even have textbooks. Our teachers have done a good job of finding content that is aligned with the curriculum, but then they have to photocopy for our students. The state also required us last year to uh, copy and administer over 4,000 common exams. But the kicker is this. Our state allotment for classroom materials and textbooks combined does not even cover the costs of the copies that our students need. These past few years have been difficult for public education and for teachers. But many institutions and professions have, had, have been negatively impacted by the economy. Thankfully, as I visit the schools in Macon County this, at the beginning of this school year, I've seen strong community support. Churches and community organizations have provided meals for teachers and school supplies for students. This community support has helped teachers to have positive professional attitudes and get this school year off to a great start. The community support and attitudes of our teachers and our students tell me that public education in Macon County is not broken. Public education in North Carolina is not broken. These are strong <laughs> and we all understand, all of us understand this. We have the best students in the world in our classrooms and in our schools. They deserve the best resources and the best teachers that we can provide. Thank you. Okay, uh, coming over the mountain, over Cowley, we have Dr. Michael Murray from Jackson County, Superintendent of Jackson County Schools. It's an honor and privilege to be able to stand in front of you and, and discuss this, this topic. We, um, Chris had sent out a little email last week and I picked it up on Friday, so I didn't, I didn't plan on a major speech for you, but I, I do, I, number one, Macon County is, a, is it's very important to us because we're all Western North Carolina school systems and we're all rolling up our sleeves and we're working together. I'm extremely pleased to be working with you to be superintendent. And this is my third year in Jackson County. Um, I followed Sioux Nation. She was like fond Aunt B in Mayberry. So uh, ultimately, tried real hard to sort of make some changes. Even though we had a wonderful school system, I'm on the great school system. And as we're trying to be progressive in a, in a very difficult time, it, it is inspiring that we're getting all the local support that we're getting. And, and I will, everybody made me feel real welcome when I came to tonight. Thank you. And, and I've met a lot of retired educators out here. And again, on your backs and the hard work that you've done for years, we, we are not a broken system. We're, we're winning every day as far as the battle of educating children, making them globally competitive, and watching them get the confidence and the skills they need. And we're teaching all God's children, which a lot of well, the privates and others out there can't say. They're all, they're all, they're all benefit to us. We, they're, we're privileged to work with, with everybody's child. My dad is a Baptist minister and has been for 30 years in, in a place called Madison County. And ultimately, I worked with Patsy Kiever for several years in Bunker. This is my third school system and 30 years in public education. And I will tell you, in all that time, I've never been as downhearted with the support we're getting as far as state support and federal support stepping away from public education. And I know you feel the same way because you're, a lot of you are retired and you're seeing that they're charging you for your health insurance. They're doing things that they've never said they would do. They're taking away the tenure. Uh, again, 2018, tenure will be no more. And, the, and I was a principal that promised my folks, we can't give you a raise. We can't even tell you that you're doing a great job without some criticism out there. But, and we were froze for years on career ladder. And 
now they're telling us that that property right that I that I proudly offered folks and we're not getting paid enough anyway, it can be taken away in 2018. And what's worse, now as your superintendent and myself and the other superintendents all have to decide who to give the, the, the contracts to after 2018. And we can only pick 25%. That's the most divisive, underhanded attack on public education that has ever come across my career in 30 years. And I'll see you We ought to everyone lock arms and tell them just to keep it. That we don't have to as far as I'm concerned, the first lawsuit. The first lawsuit that comes out in 2018 are going to be backing up with that so quick it'll make your head swim. And I'm telling you, our people deserve that. So um, when, when it comes right now, again, that would be a preacher. I try not to get into that kind of mode, so I'll, I'll tone it down. But um, I, I, was, I was telling folks the other day, I, I said, you know, I've never worked with more dedicated people in public education. We have taken it for years and made it work for them, and then turn right around when you need it the most, they step away. So I, I'm, I'm telling you, from somebody that's been in this a long, long time, that's a sad state of affairs, and we can't let it happen. And, and as we look at making those decisions, I know for a fact, in, in Jackson County, I was luckier to have been making. We, we had, we had a, a pretty good size fund balance that, not Mike Murray, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not that great a manager. There, those folks for years saved money and, and did their best, including the nations I mentioned earlier, and we had a, a healthy fund balance. I looked at the commissioners and said, we will not lose one TA. My teacher assistants are extremely valuable in my organization. They, are, they truly lower that class size, and people can say what they want. It's the number of class uh, teachers and the number of, of adults per child that make the biggest difference for us, and I didn't lose a soul. We lost 11 teaching positions in funding. We lost $270,000 worth of TAs, and we didn't lay one person off in Jackson County, and they're all still employed. And we're going to do that for a few years. Secret again is, is the advocate for children, which every person in this room that believes in public education knows that's what it's all about. We advocate for children. They can give vouchers, they can do whatever they want to do, but at the end of the day, the people that love their children are public school educators who really have never made a fortune, but they at least were able to make a living. Now they can't. So just keep in mind, I did lose a, a principal too. I lost, and I'll tell you exact salary. I lost the principal that took a job in Tennessee two months ago who, who went from a principalship and took a $38,000 pay raise to be an assistant principal at a smaller school. So I'm going to tell you, if you think we can compete, and I had the privilege of, of when, when Corey came the other day of having a, a, a private discussion with him, and my comment was this, if you think when all our baby boomers retire that we're going to have the best and brightest, or we're going to be able to even have a warm body in there to, to teach your children, it's not going to happen when I'm losing teachers and, and principals and everyone else to the counties or the states all around us because we don't value education in North Carolina. So again, I want to encourage all of you as you, as you keep supporting public schools, I know there's a lot of groups in here that do that every day, I want to thank you for that support. Realize that a lot of us are getting very vocal now at the end of my career at this point, and, I'm, and I've been traveling for the last two weeks, I've had one day off. We've hit a lot of different places having discussions. I fired up my entire faith community. You know, I have 32 uh, churches in the Tuckasee CG Baptist Association. I feel 10 times more at home in, in, the, in the church than I ever did in the boardroom. So I, I've, been, I've been asking for prayer, and there's a higher power out there that's going to end up, end up delivering us all. But I, I ended up not only resonating with the churches in our community, they're, they're all supporting the schools. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that through the grassroots efforts especially by organizations tonight, that we will make a difference and, and at least acknowledge that North Carolina loves our children and we really want to do what's best for them. Thank you for giving me the time. Thank you so much for those inspiring words, Dr. Murray. Thank you so much for making the trip. Uh, next person to speak is my good friend, Jim Breedlove, Chairman of the Macon County uh, Board of Education. I'm not going to have a speaker where I can walk around like the superintendent did, so you're stuck with me standing in one place. 
I hope I don't bore you to death tonight because I'm going to use a, throw a lot of figures out at you. And the sad part of this is none of it's good. None of the figures are good, so go into it. But I'm hoping by the time I finish, you will get some idea of what to make the County Board of Education has to struggle with this year as far as finances go. We do have our other two board members, by the way, in attendance. Mr. Gary Shields is here. is also here. And I can promise you we all take the, our duties and our call very, very seriously. I'm going to start out by giving you some numbers, so bear with me again. Just listen to what, as, as we go through. The first I'm going to use is $174,000. The second figure I'm going to say is $673,000. Next figure, $905,000. Next figure, one million two hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars. One million sixty-five thousand dollars. Those are figures summed up over a five-year period, which totals four million eighty-two thousand dollars. That, my friends, is the figure that the state of North Carolina, through what's called reversion, has taken away from Macon County Schools. Every year we go in and, and the legislature will meet and they give you, I think you've heard what Chris mentioned, it's called the ADM, your planning allotment. And all of that we work and we try to come up with the best budget that we can. And we go in thinking this is what we is. So reversion works something like this. I'm going to use last year as the example. And this is very naive, but hopefully it makes sense. We were told by the state of North Carolina that we could expect to receive from our allotment, $25,352,000. And that's what we had to use to make our, you know, try to make a budget. However, if you remember that big figure, after telling us that, then they come back to us and say, well, we're so sorry, but guess what? You've got to find ways to pull out of what we said you could have to make up that difference. Now, how many of y'all in your household budget would like to be faced with something like that? It's not easy, folks, and it gets, and it's going here, and I'm going to kind of repeat some things that Chris just said to kind of tell you what took place this year. Starting our budget process, we were told through plan allotment, we were told, and we'll see if Chris nods his head pretty much, this is what you expect this year. So we went into our budget process, and we had expected to receive about $25,490,000. So we did our best. We took that figure, and even as we started out, we were told or warned that we would probably not receive about a million and ninety one million ninety six thousand of that figure. And we took that into account. What we did is we sat down, and at the beginning of the year, we found about nine hundred and seventeen thousand dollars that we said it's going to hurt, but we're going to try to make this cut to try to keep our children and give them the best education we can. And in the interim, we've done even more than that. As Chris was telling you, we have now lost, or not lost, but we've attributed 14 teacher positions. We've attributed teacher assistance positions by the summit of around 10, I think it is, Chris. We are now having two of our elementary schools that do not have assistant principals. Now folks, think about what we're talking about. We have elementary schools with young children who need to be educated we have one principal trying to oversee that, and he has no help. He or she has no help in the form of a lead teacher or assistant principal. That is not good, okay? So we start out at $917,000, and through things that we've done, we've actually cut well over $1.1 million. So that leads me into the final version. So we started out this year, we made cuts that we failed. We've actually gone over and above, we felt like. So working off our plan allotment of what I just said, $25,490,000, um, we did our best, figured about $1.1 million. Well, here's what the state did to us. And we'll see if Chris nods his head on this also. Instead of reversion, they looked at us and sent a message and said, we're going to take care of you all. We're going to take care of you. We're going to look at the areas that you have cut in the past where you reverted funds and didn't use those. And we're going to do that for you. We see the percentages that you've taken out of your teacher's allotments. We see the portions that you've taken out of textbook supplies. And we will take care of you. We will take care of that for you. So 
So I'm going to look at you and say, can you imagine what our faces looked like when we found out? It wasn't $1.1 million that they took. It's $1.6 million that, our, that we just simply didn't receive. Folks, that's not easy. <laughs> it is not. It's very sobering. And the sad part of it is, is that everyone here that's, that came out tonight, we did it for one reason. And that is try to educate our children the best we can. Well, what's going on is that due to the actions our state is taking, we can no longer give the children the education they deserve at this point. Every morning I wake up and I say, thank God, Macon County has the type of educators that we have. Because if we didn't, our children would be suffering. We have the best teachers. So wrapping up, I'm sorry if I bored you with all the numbers, but I hope it made an impression on you to understand being a board member is not an easy job anymore. Being a teacher is definitely not an easy job. When you're over it, as you said, we've seen the things where class levels are going up, and we teach more children, you don't have your instructional supplies, our teachers have to take time to make copies in lieu of textbooks because we don't have the money to buy the textbooks. I'll say one final thing and then we'll hush. When you see your county commissioners on the street, I do want you to walk up to them and say thank you for making county schools. Without their help, this year, for example, they, they increased the amount that we give us. This year, their allotment was $7.3 million. And it's like one of the commissioners said, it should not be up to our county to fund education. That should be the responsibility of the state of North Carolina. It doesn't work out that way. Our commissioners have stepped up. They've helped us bridge the gap that we have, and then we're able to hopefully give and continue to give our children what they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And as Jim mentioned, uh, what does make it still work here in Macon County uh, are the quality of people that we do have in the classrooms. And I'm uh, very proud and pleased to introduce to you the Macon County Teacher of the Year, uh, first grade teacher in South Macon, Melissa Fates. just don't have what we need. So I'm here to just kind of share a little bit of my story, what my classroom is like right now. Um, we've been hit hard. You know, you talk about the textbooks. I don't have textbooks in my classroom. We have some old reading books that we're able to use, but our math books were consumables and we don't have them. They couldn't purchase them this year. So my students don't have practice textbooks. Now, the copies, yes, we'd love to make copies of all of these materials. But our copy count has been cut so drastically that we can basically use one page per student per day. Now, I won't name them. Some of them might or might not be here, but I've seen my colleagues making handwritten copies for 21 students in their classroom of the same thing, just so they could have that for their students to work with. That's where we're at. So we think about this, and the, all of these cuts, all these things that have been hard in these in these materials, none of them come to what has been the cut in our teacher assistants. As I said earlier, personnel is everything. That student to teacher ratio is everything. I, I think often there's a misunderstanding about what a teacher assistant is. They're not there to simply make copies. They're not there to walk our students up and down the hallways. That's not what they're there for. They do so much more. Quick, quick example. 
is in my classroom, I can teach a math lesson. I'm going to give you two scenarios. The first one is you walk into my classroom to observe my class during a math lesson, studying basic addition. You can see three groups working. I'm working with a large group over here. We're working on our basic addition skills. We're doing practice activities. We've got math manipulatives out. We're working through these. You see my teacher assistant over in the corner who's trying to work with those students that are not ready yet. They need to work on their basic number sets. They just aren't there. But with this corner of a teacher assistant, I can do that. I can have a and another corner who is getting challenge activities. They're working on problem solving. They're working independently. Sounds pretty good. Scenario number two, you walk in my classroom, you observe my class doing the same thing, basic addition. It is me standing in front of an entire group of 20 to 25 first graders, who, by the way, have an attention span of eh, five to six minutes. And I have to teach one size fits all. Our students are not robots. We're not working in a factory. My students are not one size fits all. I've got students with various disabilities. I've got students who need to be challenged. I have students on every level of the spectrum. Behavior problems, home life issues. They, it just doesn't work like that. So a teacher assistant makes all the difference in the world. And like I said, We've got a higher accountability so, to our students, and we've got teachers have a higher accountability for their classrooms. And right now, when all of these changes are happening, we have to sit there and wonder why we're not putting all our funding and all of our efforts where it's needed most. So I, I've been teaching, I've been teaching 10 years. Um, I've had nine years in first grade. And a lot of people always ask me, why first grade? Well, we know from research that in kindergarten, second grade, we teach students how to read. By the time they hit third grade, they need to be able to read to learn. So by the time they're in third grade, if they can't read, there's a huge disparity. That gap gets huge. In first grade, I can close that achievement gap before it begins. That's why I choose where I am. I get to give my students a solid foundation. And that means the world to me. So if we know that the primary grades are so vital, and that teacher assistants are so important to our classroom, we again have to stop and ask ourselves, why are we not focusing on this? Why are we cutting where we should be investing? And that is where we're at right now. So finally, I'm just gonna end, and I hope you'll forgive me for doing this, but hopefully some of our media organizations will help to spread this invitation. But I have to feel that if you are a politician in our area who's here to represent us, that the only way you could, they could have voted for this, voted for this bu budget, was that they simply were not informed. That they simply just didn't know better. So. <laughs> knowing this, I'm, I'm going to send out an open invitation. Our local rep representatives, we've got Representative West, Representative Senator Davis, I invite either one of them to come spend a day in my classroom. <laughs> but, you, see, you are not coming to observe me. If you choose to accept, if they choose to accept the, this invitation, they must come be a participant. Because I don't have time for somebody to sit and watch. I need them actively involved. So a couple, a couple key things. Number one, if they come, they should probably limit their coffee intake in the morning. <laughs> My students walk through the door at 7.30 a.m. They don't go to PE till 1.30. So bathroom breaks are limited. Um, we do have a lunch break, 30 minutes with our students. Uh, by the time you get them through the line, make sure your meal is not too fancy because we have about 10 minutes to eat. Okay, I don't have lunch on my own. I don't get to go out to eat. None of our teachers here do. They know exactly what I'm talking about. Any personal phone calls to the doctor's offices, things like that, need to make sure those things are done after school time. We can't have our cell phones with us and make step out of the classroom of 20 students and say, oh, excuse me, I've gotta go make a phone call. That's not possible for us. 
So those are just a couple things. And when my students leave at 3.30 in the afternoon, my day is not done. So I would ask that if they choose to accept this invitation, that they would stay with me until all of my papers are graded, my room is cleaned back up, my planning is done, my paperwork is done, and all of my parent meetings are done. These are all part of our careers. So I'm going to end. Thank you so much for giving me your time. Um, the one thing I will hopefully like to remind you all is as teachers, those of you who are here and our teachers, those of you who are here and our parents and are concerned and unhappy with the state of education right now, you can go ahead and get out your calendar books right now. November 4th, 2014, we get to vote again. How can you not invest in this kind of person? Got those kind of tools, that kind of passion, that kind of work ethic, that kind of global awareness, North Carolina teaching a fellow. We cut a program. Think about what the marginal cost was for the North Carolina teaching program. They get to go to one of the 16 UNC system schools. Think of what the marginal cost was to add a handful of students at those 16 institutions, take our best and brightest out of North Carolina public schools, put them in our, UN, in, in our, in our university system, and have them go teach for four years in our public schools, and we cut that. Unbelievable. Okay, we now are going to open up for question and answer. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, if you please raise your hand. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> oh my God. If there's one person I didn't want to upset, uh, Rena Sutton has been with me in the foxhole, the trench of public education for my entire 18 years in it. And if you're under attack, you don't want anybody else in that foxhole with you other than Rena Sutton because the ammunition's going to come, the coffee's going to be hot, and we're not going to stop until we're done or they're quick coming at us. So I'm going to turn it over to Rena Sutton. Good evening. I am an educator and I am a counselor. I combine both of those uh, fields in my uh, job every day. I advocate for students and I advocate for educators. Someone has to. I want to talk tonight about the psychological effects of less funding upon educators, cumulative but especially this year. This year I stood at the door, as I had the last several, and I tried to welcome each and every student as they walked in the school doors the first day of school, and welcome and hug every parent I could get my hands around. In the work days before and in the days ahead, I noticed that even though the educators at my school returned to school with ironclad determination and a wonderful work ethic, I could read their faces and study their body language and it was perfectly clear that they weren't the same. It was as if each of them were struggling to hold their shoulders up and no one was quite able to get a clean breath of air in their lungs. The smiles were sincere but less frequent and somewhat forced. Everyone was kind but a little less interactive. We were all in the same boat, but hardly anyone had the energy to fight the emotional fatigue and the disappointment this year brought. There had been no time to have a chat, and everyone was in a rush. One point I must emphasize, we were as focused as ever. It is our profession, and we are the professionals, and we know that we once again will do and go above and beyond our call of duty and hope that that will be enough for our students, accompanied by the efforts of their parents in the community. 
we are probably even more reflective than we've ever been before because we know it is not the fault of the students and we are determined that they succeed. The county commissioners have done well. Someone had to do well. Our train was going down the track and it was about to be derailed and they came in. With the help of attrition, loss of uh, the death march of many positions at least for a few years until we change things around. You may ask why the gloom? At South Macon, I'll give you one instance. We lost two outstanding teachers at the end of the year who decided it was time for them to retire. They were loving, kind, and outstanding in every way. They devoted 60 to 70 hours a week to their work. I can identify with that. They were beautiful human beings, they still are, and they were at the top of their profession. We still have a school full of those type of people. That's what makes South Macon work. We lost another teacher to a transfer and we lost assistance. We missed them. Our janitors helped to load the cars. Parents are getting a good deal for their taxes. We're getting nutritious foods now more than ever. Our children are learning to see foods that their parents can't afford at home. You know, salads, protein, complex carbohydrates. <clears throat> I asked the uh, teachers to tell me in emails, of course after work, um, how they felt. And these were the words they used. Disrespected, unappreciated, betrayed, survivors of the greatest lies, misrepresented, dishonored, and fatigued. They were expected to do more with less. Less money, time, assistance, specialists, supplies, books, etc. Educators feel a great sense from children. From those that would detach themselves from the poor, the common man, and their children. I'm so tired of hearing self-righteous persons tell me that they're tired of throwing money at education. I have over 30 years of uh, experience as an educator and about that many years or more of being a political activist. I write the same people you invited. I've already invited them, Melissa, time and time again. I hope they take you up on it. Young teachers are broke. Middle year teachers, middle of their profession, they are broke as well. Older teachers like I am, but powerful like I am, cannot afford to retire because we still have a long life ahead of us. We still have grandchildren. We still have children. We don't want them to leave them with our debt load. Peter Mine said that the, most, the, the ultimate disrespect, in fact several peers read me this, was to offer us 25% increase, uh, offer 25% of us an increase of 500 whole dollars to turn against each other. This is inhumane. You do not talk to us like that. How dare you, whoever you are, have you ever gotten down on earth and walked around with real people? We are the ones that teach you. We love you. What happened to you? How dare you? Throw us in a cage and offer us a bone so we can turn on each other. With most of us dying in the process and giving up hope, and those that won wondering why they won it. 
I'm sorry, I just have to say this, or die. I'd rather not die. I'm a real patriot. I raised three sons, very active ones. They kind of took after me and Alton. Um, it wasn't easy and it was even harder once I got them raised and I realized what I'd done to them. I have four grandsons and I'm afraid I'm going to have the same effect on them. If I were Brian, Mark, and Mick, I'd run and never let me see those boys again. I raised my children to that school. I'm a hugger, kisser, and best lover person. But I'll tell you what, I believe people that are wealthy need to have dignity and benevolence to be truly rich or noteworthy. I would hate to go down as a supporter that degraded public schools for my own advancement. And I want you to consider that if I gave my community opportunity, uh, opportunity scholarships to save in taxes because I'm a CEO, then most of my community works for me. So they all be beholden to me, so none of the parents were ever asking for a raise. And when I run for an office, they'll vote for me, won't they? What a setup. So I ask you, I implore you, I forgot to tell you, District 1A Director of NCAE, so I worked myself crazy over that too after I stayed at school for six or seven. I implore you, I dare you, to join with these coalition members including the NCAE as a member or a non-member, or I will be a member someday when I can afford it. I want you to plan and collaborate and fix this situation so public education can rise to the top again in North Carolina, my home state. Thank you, Rena. And now we will do question and answer. Rodney's going to wrap us up. So, uh, anybody else like to ask a particular question? I was just wondering if your organization is planning a legal challenge to the constitutionality of diverting uh, public funds to private schools, both on the state and federal level. Rodney, answer that. Absolutely. I will tell you that I was in Washington, D.C. meeting with the National Education Association General Counsel, and we had a very lengthy discussion about this very issue, and they intend at the national level to support us as much as they possibly can, but we are in the very early stages of filing a lawsuit against the state of North Carolina over the voucher issue, as well as career status or tenure, as it is more commonly referred to. So, yes. So, another question.
established, the idea behind it was that they were going to, uh, a portion of the funds would go for the reconstruction and building of schools throughout the state of North Carolina. So it was never really intended to you know, supplement the budget or at our local schools or in our local school system. That was never the intent of it. So I, 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 from my understanding, they just recently changed the allocation for that, but again, it still is not coming to public schools throughout the state. I can tell you that personally, I've witnessed where they are building new schools in areas that I would argue may or may not need them as much as they need, as much as there are schools in rural and other areas throughout the state that need to be renovated and or rebuilt, totally torn down and destroyed. I'll tell you, this is a perfect example. Um, at one of the Moral Monday protests, I, along with several others, one I had a good conversation with earlier today, were arrested. And I think you'll agree with me when we say that uh, the biggest, the most uh, disturbing fact about that entire experience was walking into a prison facility and looking around and recognizing that this building is in better shape than most of the schools I've visited throughout this state. So that just goes to show you that they are not nearly investing the type of the amount of money into constructing and renovating schools in this state as they should, based on what they said they plan to do with that lot of money when they first established. I told you. Exactly. And there was another question over here. Should we turn this off and stop the bottom? Well, I was wondering, would it be fair to characterize what the state legislature has done in overall cutting about a half billion dollars in tax revenue over the next several years, while at the same time cutting about half a billion dollars out of education over the seven the next several years, as stealing from our children and our future in order to give to the wealthiest among us? I think we can all agree, yes. <laughs> I, I would say that. Well, that's a very good solution. Absolutely. I don't know if I can even add anything. You say it perfectly. Over here. Yes, sir. Coming around. Come on. I get it. Got it. John, I guess that since this is an informative meeting, I want somebody to explain to me in layman's terms how a charter school can be compared to public schools money-wise. What do you mean by money-wise exactly? charter schools being labeled as public schools. I know they are, and they say they're public schools, but what is, what is the rationale for it? Uh, originally, and this is, you know, the mission's been forgotten. The original mission of charter schools in North Carolina were to serve as laboratories that were going to be basically owned and operated by North Carolina teachers. If you had a half dozen, dozen teachers who had a very good idea as to what they might be able to do, they would find an abandoned storefront someplace, set up a, uh, a small school, and try something new. And then if that worked out, then the larger school in the area would adopt it. There were to be miniature labs. Somehow, along the way, profit motive got involved. And that shifted the mission. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Very, very close. Just a, a couple of points about charter schools and uh, private school vouchers right now. Uh, over the next two years, North Carolina is going to fund private schools for the amount of about $50 million. That $50 million is broken down across the state by a lot of textbooks for, the, for our children here in Macon County and other counties across the, the state. But I'd also like to point out Charter school called the Kinston Charter. Have you ever read about it in the news uh, this past week? Uh, somehow or another, they've lost $663,000. All of their children, all those children that were enrolled in Kinston Charter School, now have to go find uh, other schools to go to. Uh, I'd like to point out that the Kinston Charter School is a private school. Uh, it's not a public school. Uh, it's a private school. Uh, 
in the district around our private our public schools to serve those children. That $662,000 is a dollar. That money could have bought a lot of textbooks for Macon County as well. And while John's getting that answer, so I'd just like to add one little thing on to that. Um, folks, I, I think we need to recognize exactly what this is or what it is. And it is, quite honestly, an attempt to privatize education in the state of North Carolina. There's a profit to be made on students. And there are people out there who will profit over those students before they prefer to educate them. I just heard one of the superintendents mention that in the state of North Carolina, we are at we are above 80% of our graduation rates in public schools, and yet they want to open the door for virtual charter schools to come into this state simply because there's a profit to be made off of them. The same thing with charter schools, the same thing with funding money from public schools into private schools. People are profiting off of that, and that is what they intend to do. They're going to privatize education in this state so that the wealthy, wealthy can profit off of public school I offer your tax dollars, my tax dollars, while they turn public schools into what is ultimately going to be a dumping ground for the students who cannot afford to go to private schools and are not accepted in charter schools. That is a very important point to make, is the fact that neither of those two entities are required to accept every student that comes through their door the way the public schools are. I would argue that in public schools, parents are sending us the best that they have. And educators are doing the best that they can to provide them with the quality education to help them go off and be successful in life. And I am outraged that they are trying to privatize and make profit off of the students' lives in this state.
I know the suggestion I can make as a superintendent, and that suggestion is let's let's pay attention to what the real motive here is. Do not let them divide and conquer our school families. That doesn't need to happen. One of the issues with this top 25% uh, is an indication of, of uh, all, all that we're having to deal with right now. And that is that this, these are no longer educational policies uh, that used to, like we used to have to deal with from DPI or something like that. This is a legislative uh, policy. It's basically a law. So it's going to be very difficult for us to deal with. And I can promise you this, we're going to put it off as long as we can before we have to deal with any of it. But you're exactly right. It's basically conquer, or divide and conquer. You'll, you'll be given an option, and, and I'm, I want folks to understand this too. That this isn't the only divisive. They're grading schools. I got a little child to get on a bus and go to Cherokee, um, which is Smoky Mountain Elementary for us, which because of poverty and other reasons, they do wonderful things in that school. But I promise you that school will be ranked as C, D, or F. There's no, if you link that, it's all on poverty. They, we put that off for a year, but it's coming. And we're going to have to grade our schools and, and again, does that have anything to do with what we're doing in those schools? No. What that has to do with your kids in Providence today and you're rich, they'll have an A school and they'll brag on them all over this state. But the, the Cherokee school where the teachers have to work day and night just to, just to make that gap go away and from the poverty that they're dealing with, then we're going to be called an F school. So again, you will have a choice because what they're telling us is this, is that where you get to pick, and, and again, think about this, I've got hundreds of employees, I get to pick basically 60, 60 teachers that I'm going to give this to, alright? Now, you tell me how I can do that without being random and capricious, because that's what the lawsuit's going to say when they take me to jail, alright? So keep in mind uh, that we can come up with all the criteria, and that's what they're having us do right now, we're sitting around coming up with criteria, and I sit there thinking, there's no criteria. If we did it all the exact same way, we're still all going to get sued and we're still all going to lose because it's, it's not right. But when it comes right down to it, yes, teachers will have a choice. I, if I'm a teacher and you're offering me, it's not 500, it'll be 5,000. What not to talk until you got 5,000 in four years. So if I'm a teacher who's already in terrible shape out there and you're offering me 5,000 over four years, period. All right, that if I'm close to retirement and my prime retirement is based on my last three to four high years, what, what would you want to do as a person if, if you had a choice? If, if I'm one of those folks who are several years away from retirement, I'd turn it down in a heartbeat because truthfully, I think if you took that money, if I offered you more of one of my lucky 60 in Jackson County and I offered you that money and you took it, I think in 2018 when the first lawsuit comes about, that you've given up your tenure because you've taken the money. I would tell any, any of the folks, even if we did it, don't take that money because you're going to get your tenure back. You haven't lost that. You've temporarily lost it, but that was a property right. You'll get it back. But if you sign off that you want to be one of these 25 and you get your four years, that, was that worth the tenure that you, you've earned in the, in the career? More or less, it's what the lady said earlier. That, do we want to treat people like that? Would you want to live with, with that kind of book? When, you, when the people down the hall are working just as hard as you are, but by some reason, whatever it was, whatever that criteria was, you got selected. Now, you tell me, we're, we're telling all our folks to share what's going on in your classroom, to work together. We've worked for years for this, so that everybody are doing innovative ideas, practices at work, we're all working together to, to raise each other up. You tell me how you can do that if somebody two doors down is going to get $5,000 more this year, and because and you think you're going to share their, your ideas with them? What a divisive, cruel, terrible thing to put in place. Don't stand for it. I mean, that that, right. that $5,000 over four years doesn't just end there either, though. In 2018, if you accept that, you'll receive $2,000 a year over a $2,000 raise of what you would be earning if you didn't choose that to get 5%. For the rest of your career. Basically, that's what they're saying right now. I can tell you that one teacher told me the other day though, that the same thing happened in Florida and they ran out of money after one year. It's discontinued after one year. So it's a quandary. But do you trust them? Career ladder, they froze you for 15 years after they gave you that little token bonus. You were froze for years and first year teachers made more than you did and you've been there 10 years because you took the money. So again, just realize 
This isn't pretty. I mean, overall, it's not something that you're, we've seen it before with real out and other things. And really, just pay people what they're, what they're worth, let them expect it for that college degree, and they've earned it, and you pay the people that are with the children higher than you pay anybody else out there, and, and do the right thing for people. Don't, don't bribe you with a care and state, and that's what they're doing. And, and keep in mind, they still owe us ABC bonus money, so. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to make one comment about the economic impact, you know, which, which those in Raleigh don't seem to be considering. Uh, one of the first things that companies and individuals think about before they move a business is the school system. People will not be trying to bring people in at the engineering level or the, you know, the computer engineers. You can't get them to come to places where the education system is going to be bad. Their kids are going to be in that system. They will have nothing to do with it. Companies will not relocate here if that is what they are going to be moving into. So if they think that this is some kind of long-term solution, this is going to bankrupt the state. It was my understanding that if you were one of the 25% of, of the teachers, that you had to teach those third graders that did not pass those end of grade tests for that year and had to be put in that special fourth grade classroom. And if you refused to take on that class, then they were not going to award you that four-year contract. Did I misunderstand that? My understanding of that, that's basically the read to achieve law. And if a third grader does not pass the third grade and the grade test in reading, then they have to go to summer school. That summer school class must be taught by one of your top 25% uh, career teachers. If the third grader at that point does not master the third grade objectives, then they have to go, uh, they're retained in the third grade the following year, and they are placed on an accelerated reading plan. They can be promoted mid-year, but the most important thing is, is that the class must be taught by one of your top 25 percent, and they must use a research-based reading strategy. But what do you think is going to happen to those teachers if they really take on these third grade, these third, fourth grade students? Not all of them will pass. So that what's going to happen is that teacher's no longer in that top 25 percent. So they're going to lose their their little contract. How do you know they won't be in the top 25 percent? What's the criteria for the top 25%? <laughs> it's not necessary. It's not necessary. Yeah. No. It can be I'll, let, I'll let Ms. Bates answer that, that last thing. <laughs> South Macon Elementary School has come up with a, an outstanding plan for how to determine the top 25%. <laughs> Sounds like another not very well thought out uh, bit of legislation that we see this year. Please, let's get this young man's voice in the room. Well, I wanted to know just how we can help and how we can, like, donate money if we can. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so that is the perfect segue into my segment of this evening's event. And I guess I better introduce myself since that hasn't happened yet. My name is Rodney Ellis. I'm an eighth grade language arts teacher from the Winston Salem Forsyth County School System. I currently serve as the president of the North Carolina Association of Educators, and I'm a proud product of the public school education. I have four children, two daughters, uh, two, my two oldest daughters are in college. One of them is with me tonight. My oldest daughter is a senior at Western Carolina. <laughs> My second daughter is a senior at UNC Charlotte, and both are products of the public school education. So when you tell me that our school system is broken, I say you lie. That's, yeah, no. Um, and I've got two more kids who are currently in public schools in, in Nightdale, North Carolina. So because of those four young people, and because of all of the educators throughout this state, and I like to feel like speaking on behalf of them in these days, 
I'm at the point where I'm tired of talking about what all they've done and I'm ready for action. So again, thank you, young man, for asking that question, what can we do? Because I have some things that you can do. And so the first thing, we need to make sure that our elected officials know where you stand on the decisions that they are making that impact public education. Right now, educators across this state have reached the level of frustration that there is a Facebook movement asking teachers to walk out of the classroom. I want you to know that NCAE does not advocate that because I believe that as an educator, your first priority is to be there for those students, and we support that. I also believe that an act like that would not be successful without the parental support that it would need, and it would instead turn parents against us. So we are trying to encourage those individuals not to take that action, but to inform them that there are other actions that you can take. But I think it's important to point out that that is indicative of the level of frustration that educators in this state are feeling. And we are about to witness a mass exodus of quality educators from this state. And I think that's the most drastic impact that their decisions are going to have. I cannot tell you the number of my colleagues who have said that they will not stay in North Carolina another year to teach. The ones that have already left, we are losing the best and brightest educators that we have. We are losing all of our experienced educators who've been in the game and they're close to retirement and they would have stayed and taught four, five, six, four years, but they've said, no, I'm done. And so that is the greatest harm that these decisions are, are, are having is that we're losing quality educators and then you turn around and in the same breath say that you want the best and brightest educators for the student in North Carolina and then you chase them off. That's just stupid. Um, so, so instead of a walk out, what we are now having conversations about is having a walk in. Well, we do exactly what our Teacher of the Year here suggested, is that we invite legislators into our schools and have them spend the day. And just like she said, don't come in and, and pass by the class and wave and read a book. Come in and be a part of the work that educators do in these buildings every day. So I would encourage you, if you're an educator, join Rena and Johnson. Join Rena and Melissa. Send them emails and invite them to come into your school buildings. And if not, at least let them know how you feel about the decisions that they made. I think one of the most important voices that is missing in this fight, or, and it is a fight, is the voice of parents. How many parents who are not educators in this room tonight? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. You have taken the first step in your call to action by coming here, receiving this information, and now what you do with it will determine what the rest of this state is going to look like in the future because they don't often listen to NCAE because I'm over there every day and they know what I'm going to say. Stop the madness. They already know that's coming out of my mouth. Here's what you should be doing versus what you're doing. But when they start hearing from parents, it takes a whole, a whole new meaning for them. It takes on a whole new meaning. So you, I definitely encourage to reach out to those legislators and let them know how you feel. You can write letters to the uh, uh, letters um, to the editor of your local newspaper. I know that there's some media in the house and probably some local uh, uh, reporters. Talk to them. Let them know how you feel about what's going on. Talk to your friends and your neighbors. Engage them in this fight because that's that's key, folks, and that's why we're here today, actually because we are trying to get this message out around the state of North Carolina. The decisions that they are making are not impacting just educators, they are impacting students, they are impacting parents, and it's going to make it difficult for us to continue to grow and be the leading state in education that we once were. And so contact those folks and let them know. One of the things that NCAA is sponsoring this year is a Wear Red campaign. Every Wednesday of this year, every educator in this state is being asked to wear red. If you have not worn red on a Wednesday, um, wear it next Wednesday or this Wednesday. And if you're a parent, join us in this campaign. Tie a red ribbon on your mailbox or something of that nature to show your support for public education. But, but you know, wear red on Wednesdays, that's one of the other things we're doing. But the most important thing, folks, the most important thing, and I'm glad Melissa mentioned it, is that we have to vote. Now, I want to preface this statement by saying clearly, this, for me, is not about parties. It is not about what your party affiliation is. 
It is about electing pro-public education candidates for the state of North Carolina who are going to do what's right and what's best for our students. So then, know that there are 177,000 public school employees in North Carolina. There are 1.5 million students in North Carolina's public school system. All of them are parents, grandparents, uh, guardians. Imagine what this state would look like if all 177,000 educators took their spouses and significant others, families and friends, if all 1.5 million students, parents and guardians and grandparents got together and went to the polls with a mission to ensure that the next person that holds these offices is a pro-public education candidate. Folks, we can run this. <laughs> if you do nothing else, November 4th of next year, be at the polls. Personally, the way I see it, you know, they've already had me arrested. I'm going to do whatever I feel like doing. And I'm going to be traveling the state, and I'm going to the polls, and I'm taking my daughters that are voting age. I'm taking my wife. I'm taking my family, my friends. And if I can stop out on the way and pick you up, I'm picking you up, and I'm taking you to the polls, too. That's the way we make a difference. In the meantime, continue to remain informed, folks. Public Schools First of North Carolina, NCAE, we want to help you get your voice out there. And if, uh, if I could get someone to put the contact information back up on the screen so that you all can see how you can follow us on Facebook, how you can follow us on Twitter, how you can sign up for our email list, sir. Uh, those are the things that you need to do because events like this are going to be popping up throughout the state. And in this community, we're not done here just in Macon. They're going to be popping up in neighboring counties. And when they do, go out there and show your support. When we're rallying for public education, go out there and be a voice for the students in your community and the children in your home. Let's be a voice. Let's make a difference. Let's turn this thing around. Let's hold these guys accountable. Hold their feet to the fire and make them do what's right and what's just for students in North Carolina. Thank you all very much. I could just say one more thing. Public Schools First is working with, Public Schools First North Carolina is working with NCAE and we're doing these tours all across the state. And we start off with some fairly bland, cold facts. But what makes these tours, what makes these town halls so wonderful is the excellent people that you have here working in your community. And I would ask that we all give one more hand to our teachers, our principals, our superintendents, and our And you see the passion that people that are actually working in the schools have. So this is, you know, we can get you started, we can get you here, but it's the people, the people that are actually working with your children. You are the ones with the passion that have to get to the polls. I can't reiterate that enough. So I thank you all. I thank John for helping organize this at the NCAE. I thank Rodney for coming all the way to Salem, our Teacher of the Year. Thank all of you for coming tonight.